HR 3325. Go support it. It's, it's a good bill. Um, it was introduced after I came here, and it is um, a bill that encompasses the whole process of using technology in the classroom. Too often we you know, send money, throw money at technology in the classroom without any sort of support for teachers. I've seen it in the classroom. I've seen it at this level. Businesses do it. Government does it. Um, the Technology Innovations Partnership Act would allow for kind of that full suite. So it would allow for technology. It would provide for connectivity if needed. It would provide for professional high quality professional development for educators that are implementing it in the K-12 classroom. But it, it doesn't just stop there, it continues. And what it does, it is also provides universities, nonprofits, private organizations with the ability to research those implementations and to find ways to scale up those innovations. Um, the federal government, as, as James kind of alluded to, cannot you know, we're, we're too slow to act to say, we gotta change this now and then change over here as, as the needs of the workforce change. But we can provide that support. Um, and we can provide for that research that allows us to know what the best way to implement technology in the classroom is. Um, and so we're working hard on moving that through. Um, last night I was visiting with Congressman Honda about this event um, and he, shared some stuff with me that I thought I'd share with you. He said that just like achieving a high level education relies on having a high quality knowledge base, you similarly can't have a high quality STEM workforce without having a high quality STEM trained citizenry. Not everybody's gonna be an engineer or a NASA scientist. Um, but this doesn't happen unless we focus, continue to focus on the needs of each and every child in this country and provide them with the human and fiscal resources that they require to be successful. We know that under, underrepresented minorities are on a path soon to become underrepresented majorities in the future. Focusing on the needs of every student, regardless of their race, regardless of their background, is vital to our future success. Failing those students who need the most support is failure for everyone. So, thank you. Let's give a panel. I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and ask the first question. Uh, and, and James, this is to you primarily, but uh, anyone can answer it. And I know that uh, as someone that's been through this process a number of times, the Virginia delegation gets together and, you know, we go to see our congressman and we go back and say, well, we tried to see too many and do we see staffers or do we see congressmen? And I guess the question I'm asking here is, you know, your coalition really is to make uh, administrators and congressmen and legislators and all aware. And so the question I have is, how do you know you're doing that uh, and so forth? Well, that's a great question. Um, one of the, there's a bunch of different ways when you're in a government relations job, there's a bunch of different ways that you think about what constitutes success. Um, if you sort of flip open you know, our annual report, for example, you're gonna find four or five highlights of things that we've done where we've moved the process in, in a particular direction. And while Congress isn't passing a lot of laws, Congress has never passed a lot of laws. Um, this, is, this is something that sort of gets lost on people when they score card Congress. Big, big changes in policy, whether it's tax policy, education, other things, happen at sudden points in time when they were typically not greatly expected. So the, the big K-12 through law that passed in 2002, No Child Left Behind, it's also called the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, was not really even a thought a couple of years earlier. In fact, the bill was actually signed to law shortly after September 11th. And who thought we were going to pass a major education law then? So you can't, the, the, the way I measure is by the number of friends that are willing to step up in the political process and put political capital behind education reform efforts that matter for STEM education. In other words, the number of champions that we have. Um, Congressman Hunt is one of those champions. We have others, you know, obviously in both sides of the aisle. But what, what we tend to judge are the number of members, 
you know, sort of starts with the ones that return our phone calls, right? <laughs> but it, but at the but the other end of the spectrum is the ones who are willing to actually take legislative action in this process because education reform, we're talking about K through 12, has a life cycle of about 20 years, and the last bill was passed in 2002. And so I would guess sometime after the next presidential election, you will have another big round of education reform. And it's going to hit higher education as well. I don't know how many, how many of your universities were at, the, at the, uh, the university summit that was at the White House a couple of weeks ago. But that's the other way in which we measure the success of our, our efforts and advocacy. It's the legislators who are aligned with our cause. And you don't generally convince legislators that they agree with you, you find them. And that is part of the challenge, is figuring out the ones who have, you know, one of the ways in which the deans help us, and you may not be aware, is you, I can't tell you how many times we've gone and met with a legislator in Iowa or Virginia, and they say, well, you know, so-and-so from our local university was in here just a couple weeks ago, and they were talking about how they didn't have the resources to do this, or they, they agreed with the same thing that you're talking about. So that's our primary measure of success in people terms, is we have to be out there a lot, and you know we do two or three meetings a week on Capitol Hill and around the administration trying to get that message out. And we do a lot of other communications, but it's really in recruiting friends and people who are allied to our cause. Thanks, Shane. Questions? This is usually not a silent <laughs> group, but. Uh, I have a I need your address afterwards to send that. <laughs> no, but, but you're right about that. In fact, I think we're real close to having 10,000 followers. And I, I actually think that is a, we've been sort of late to get involved in the social media networking aspect of this. And we are kind of ramping up our public information efforts because the voices, you all know this because you live in the engineering world, the voices of engineering are kind of the silent majority voices in the, in the policy making process. Um, you know, it's probably difficult for you to get your faculty members engaged on this. It's probably difficult to get the bandwidth of your university government relations offices on engineering education issues, but it's absolutely critical because our voice as a collective, the STEM education world, if it had the same impact on the policy process that it does on the economy, we would have solved these challenges by now. Swigert University of Memphis. There was an article on the front page of the Chronicle of Higher Education a couple months ago, basically asking the question: Is the STEM uh, crisis real or is it overblown? And since I don't spend a lot of time inside the Beltway, uh, those of you who do, is there is there a growing feeling that this is yesterday's news or is just just the uh, editorial staff of the Chronicle of Higher Education who are mostly journalists saying, you know, don't spend the money on, on STEM. But you, you indicated earlier that there may not be uniform demand for all the different STEM disciplines. Do you have a feeling on whether or not this is, a, you know, a groundswell or is it just sort of a, something that's, you know, going to go away? Well, Sean, why don't you answer that first? Cause. Uh, well, first of all, I would say on the Hill there is a, still a strong push for STEM. I don't know that that, like that article, has um, extended into the, the Hill community. And continuing to voice, like you said, that STEM flexibility in that, um, you know, it can't be about dictating one particular profession, but about allowing this flexibility for students to be able to choose what they want to do. And then having a citizenry that is, that is well-trained and informed and able to understand those types of arguments. Um, the one thing I'd add to that is the, the one big difference, part of what's contributing to the trend that you have perceived in sort of how this issue is being treated in the media is that um, the, the point I made earlier about the fact that almost every policymaker understands the issues around STEM, but that there's not really a good consensus on what the solutions look like is partly because five or six years ago before the, the Great Recession, if you will, we were dealing with 
with focusing on STEM as a priority with new resources. I mean, back when we were comfortable talking about new government programs and you know weren't weren't coping with a with you know a couple more zeros on the deficit, the 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 focus was on let's build a new program to support STEM education as a goal. Now, in the education reform world, if you want to focus something more in the STEM education arena, you've got to talk about where it's coming from, and that's part of the the you alluded to this, but it's real. That's part of where the resistance comes from. Is is does an increased focus on STEM education mean less focus on history or art or some other aspect of education? And that's not just a K through 12 problem. It, it's a problem at every stage of the game. But the the jobs issue is what's keeping this in the center, you know, the center of the public debate because parents know whether it's a PhD job or it's an auto mechanic job, if they have STEM skills, they're gonna do better in the economy. That's what's keeping it alive. i make a, a comment about that also. You know, this, the relevance of STEM education has necessarily evolved because technology has evolved so much. But we have so many people who are technology users, but those of us who are in the in the arena of technology development know that it requires a different kind of workforce, it requires a different kind of training, a different kind of education to become uh, a technology innovator, a technology maker, as opposed to a technology user. Everybody knows how to, how to use one of these, but not everybody knows how to make one or how to improve one. And, and I think when we sometimes think about the health and welfare of STEM education, I personally think in terms of a, a, a broader, more holistic, comprehensive kind of uh, view of STEM education. Yes, I want public education around technology, but I'm really very concerned about the next generation of technology innovators because they require a certain depth and a certain kind of uh, uh, training and education that you have to start early in order to get that kind of depth. I'm not, I'm not suggesting you have to all, all have to get PhDs in order to do it, but there's a big difference between the person who develops the next generation of technology and the person who uses the next generation of technology. And I believe there's a feeling across the country sometimes that the developers, the really smart people, the really genius type folks who do science and engineering, those people are going to be okay. And that science and engineering and STEM in general is okay. When we don't really know, we don't have the numbers. If you want to use numbers and, and, and labor statistics, that's only one metric of uh, how healthy our STEM enterprise actually is. Uh, some people argue that if we lose leadership in certain areas of development, some areas of biotechnology, some areas of molecular biology. If we, lose, if we lose the leadership in some of those areas, we don't regain that. It's a global competition now, far more than it probably used to be. The United States used to be the best, not only the best, but the pretty much one of the only places where you get a certain kind of education. That's not the case now. It's much more global, the competition is global, and I think the challenges are global. And without being overly patriotic, I think we have to try to be more aware of how we maintain not so much United States supremacy, but United States involvement in the development of innovation and, and STEM technology. Have another question for a panelist? Yeah, Bill. As far as the next generation science standards, um, I think it is an absolute step in the right direction in incorporating STEM, especially in the elementary, because it's something that's something I've seen as a teacher in the last just in the last year that's really become a, 
a part of the conversation. And I think a lot of it has to do with the next generation science standards and focusing on this, the, the idea that these engineering concepts can be started at a very early age um, and, and then can be built upon as students progress into secondary and then on um, in their bachelor's studies and beyond. Uh, and so I think that's really empowered it. I also think that Common Core is a step in the right direction to improve um, the math ability of all students. And again, it's, it's for all students and it's a starting point. It's the platform that lays the, the more advanced students will, will go much beyond that. Um, but it's a place where everybody needs to be. James? Um, the one thing I would add to that, um, so the, the common standards movement is a, is a really fast evolving uh, set of terrain right now. Four or five years ago, when we started the process of adopting the math standards, this was kind of an under the radar issue from a lot of people's perspective. But I don't know how much news this group consumes on the sort of political discourse of over, over federal rights versus states' rights, but it's not too hard to stumble across a story right now about how the common standards are really energizing a political debate about whether we want, you know, what the role of the federal government is, what the role of the state governments are. I think setting that aside, the next generation science standards are going to revolutionize a lot about how engineering is interfacing the K through 12 system because what you don't find, and this has happened in previous debates about standards, is you don't find the, the, the STEM community balkanized around the st standards now. The people who are in science or engineering or technology see reasons to, to support the proliferation of the new math standards because they see not only their fates intertwined, but they see the sort of the broader concept-based aspects of education and the fact that, that the outside, um, the publishing community, the content community can really align their, their, their offerings around these different standards and not have to offer a different product in every state and be able to sort of gain the efficiencies of that process as well are, are putting a lot of people on the same page of wanting to support these, these common standards in math or science. But the, the challenge, and I always take this back to advocacy is, the challenge is, again, about the sort of the silent majority that constitutes the STEM world. When you read the ed editorial pages about how these standards are being perceived at the state level, you see an awful, awfully, um, I would say, unrepresentative number of people who are STEM professionals who've, who've opened up a large standards document for the first time and said, oh my goodness, my profession is being inadequately represented by standard A, you know, 6AB paragraph 4. And that's not really what the standards are meant to be. I, I would love to see more people in the engineering community talking about these things in letters to the editor and, and sort of taking, taking a stand on these because they're going to be good for the entire profession. Okay, why don't, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just want to make one quick comment about the, the Common Core Standard approach also. You know, it, we at NASA have been very involved in, in interacting with groups that were associated with developing Common Core for both math and science. And one of the things that, that impresses us about it is that it's, it, it gets away from being so fact-based and gets more into principle-based, and it leads to a better development of problem-solving skills. And there have been any number of observations and studies that show that sometimes uh, you've got Students in graduate school, for example, uh, I saw a study once that actually got a Japanese uh, uh, education minister fired because he, <laughs> he, 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 he showed the results. And it showed that the Japanese students were coming over to America, getting into graduate school with superior computational skills to American students, and they were staying in graduate programs longer because they didn't have the problem-solving skill development that the United States students had. United States students, on the other hand, picked up the computational skills along the way, and because they had superior problem-solving skills, they actually were having shorter times to degree. And so his, his rationale was, maybe we should do a little more like the, the, the Americans. Well, that got him fired. Um, and, but it, it goes to the point of there's development of factual knowledge and there's a development of problem-solving skills. And I think the Common Core Standards find a, a, a fairly good medium ground between the two with some leaning towards the uh, problem-solving skills. And that's where I think the next generation of innovation is going to uh, benefit. So why don't we give uh, our panelists a round of applause and thank them for everything. <laughs>